What does Latin have to do with the future energy security of the entire planet? Well, I'm going to tell you about that today. I'm Luke, and this is Polymathy. Iter is a Latin word for a trip, a journey, a walk, just like when I'm making in this forest. Iter is also the acronym for the International Thermonuclear Experimental Reactor. And the goal of ITER, which is being constructed now in France, a great big international project with all of these countries funding it and working on it together, the goal is to create not the first experimental fusion reactor, there have been lots of those for decades. The goal is to create more energy from the reaction than was put into it. And this is going to lead to a new energy revolution that will happen in this century. And that's why it's called ITER. It's the way to something that has been unattainable for so long. The word iter in Latin, it's a neuter noun, and the genitive is itineris. Iter, itineris, itineri, iter, itinere. That's how it's declined in the singular. And uh, this word is also the origin of the word iterate in English. In Latin, it's iterare. It means to do something again. It means to take the same path again, to do the same journey again. And also another Latin word, iterum which means again. You may know there's two words for again in Latin. There's iterum and there's rursus. Essentially, they're synonyms, but one way they're distinguished is to say that rursus means to go back doing something again, while iterum is to go forward to do that thing again. That is, you go back to your destination with iterum and uh, you go back to your point of origin with rursus. That's not a strict rule at all. That's just one way to distinguish these two synonyms that some people have proposed. The old joke is that commercial fusion electric power is 30 years away and always will be. Uh, we've actually had fusion ever since things like the H-bomb, the original thermonuclear weapons. Nuclear fission is quite different from nuclear fusion, but they can be used together. Nuclear fission is when you take a material like uranium or plutonium, the individual atoms nuclei of which are quite heavy, they're very massive, and split them with a nuclear fission reaction. And that splitting leads to release of huge amounts of energy. And that's how nuclear fission reactors are powered. But nuclear fusion is when you take very light elements like hydrogen or isotopes of hydrogen, and you squeeze them together until they fuse, while nuclear fission creates a lot of energy. Nuclear fusion creates way more energy than that. And the basic material fuel source is hydrogen. Hydrogen's found in water. Water is found in seawater all over the planet. Unlike uranium, which is a relatively rare element in the Earth's crust, there's hydrogen everywhere. And the Isotopes of hydrogen, like deuterium and tritium, can be found in seawater, or they can even be made artificially. So there's the possibility of using this fuel that uh, is essentially everywhere. And that's sort of the notion behind why it'll be so amazing to have fusion power. And also the fact that fusion reactors won't have the ability to melt down the way fission reactors can. That is, they can have a runaway effect. Now, modern nuclear fission reactors, it's almost impossible for them to have meltdowns because they have so many incredibly made safeguards. Nuclear fission power today is incredibly safe. However, nuclear fusion, it's impossible to have a runaway chain reaction like that. Nuclear fusion is actually something we benefit from every day because it's happening right up there in the sun. Now, nuclear fusion happens in the sun. The sun is mostly made up of hydrogen and helium, really light elements. And at the core where the pressure is extremely high because the mass of the sun is so much greater than the earth or any other planet in the solar system, it's able to compress those atoms of hydrogen until they squeeze together and they fuse into helium. And fusion reactions can happen with other elements, really technically almost any element. But the really light ones are the ones that produce the most energy, like the hydrogen of the sun. But doing that on Earth is much more difficult, and a lot of clever ways have been thought up of how to do that best. Ether specifically uses magnetic confinement. It uses force fields like in Star Trek in order to force the hydrogen 
into a hot plasma. So it's super hot and it's under a lot of pressure. And that is how they'll make fusion. This has been done in other similar reactors at a smaller scale before, but ETAD is going to do it at a really big scale that is going to be extremely impressive and um, is going to uh, really set the stage for the future. So nuclear fusion power is going to be part of the future of the human race. It's going to be great, hopefully, as soon as possible in this century. It will create way more energy than anything else that we have. The ultimate fuel source is going to be derived from water, and it'll be safer and cleaner than other sources of energy that we use today. So it will be an amazing revolution when it occurs. So ITER, this project, which, how do we pronounce that in English? I'm saying ITER, pronouncing it like the Latin word it's meant to imitate. Well, in English, I've heard people say ITER, ITER, uh, otter, all kinds of things. Uh, but uh, I'd say probably the best would be to say ETER. That way you get to preserve the important vowel sounds as close as our English equivalents permit, ETER. And of course, using an English T and an English R because uh, I wouldn't expect someone to be able to say ITER unless they um, knew other languages like Latin or Italian or Spanish, etc. The origins of ITER are actually during the Cold War in between the Soviet Union and the United States, thereupon including lots of other member countries. And eventually they decided to begin building this thing in France. Now, they knew way back then that the technology wasn't there yet. It isn't quite there to actually make commercial fusion power. Now, there are fusion experiments that have been done around the world for decades where they are able to produce power, but they can't produce more power, more energy from the reaction than is being put into it. Well, that's a problem. If you use more kindling, like out of these you know, pieces of you know, wood on the ground, if we collected that and put it in a fire, if you put more fuel in the kindling than you actually got out of, uh, out of the, the fire in the, in the fireplace, well, that's not a very efficient use. But it could be a way to experiment to learn how to, you know, use kindling. And that's essentially what's been done with fusion reactors for all these decades. And I remember being really young, hearing about ETED, oh yeah, they got this plan, and the first plasma, the first time they'll actually start the fusion reaction in, in, the, uh, in ETED is going to be 2025. And I, or actually, I remember what the original year was that they mentioned, because I think it's been delayed a little bit. But uh, 2025 is when they're going to have first plasma, the first time they actually... Uh, light this thing up and cause a burning, as it's uh, referred to colloquially, of the fusion reaction in ITER. And well, what's it going to do? It is it. It's not supposed to actually create fusion power that will be available in Provence, in France, or anything like that. It's going to be experimenting with all the technologies necessary to actually then have sp the first prototype. A commercial fusion reactor based off those technologies. That's why it's this big international project, and that's why it's involved um, so much time and huge amounts of money. It's said to be one of the most expensive scientific research projects of all time, but I think it's worth it. Um, once fusion power becomes commercially available, I believe in that century, I think it will be this century, it will come to dominate uh, all other sources because it will be, at least in theory, it'll be that much uh, less expensive. Once you get it on, I mean, you'll have to build the thing, which is um, obviously uh, not going to be cheap in any situation, just like it's not necessarily cheap to build any power source. But once it's online, it will be able to produce power so efficiently and cheaply and in such large quantities that reactors like that will be able to power uh, the entire world. And of course, they'll be used for other kinds of power, such as wind and solar. But fusion power is really going to change the world. It is the way of the future. And just look at this diagram of ETER. Doesn't it look like something out of uh, the warp core of Star Trek? Of course, in Star Trek, the warp cores use a matter-antimatter reaction. That is also something that exists in real physics, but it's not used to power anything in physics. And actually doing something like that, for a lot of reasons, is definitely something that's just part of science fiction at the moment, even though theoretically it could be possible. But fusion reactors, they've been around for a while, being used for experimentation, actually having a fusion reactor that produces more power, that produces electricity, more than is actually put into the reaction. The purpose of ITER is to solve that problem, a technology demonstrator, which will allow scientists and engineers to design commercial fusion reactors, which will cleanly and safely power all of our cities 
for the foreseeable future. I'm really excited about this future. As you probably know, I love science. I love the study of the future and I love how it connects to the past as well. So I really like how something like this, ITER, is named after a beautiful and useful classical Latin word. For example, the way to take a journey, the way to make a journey in Latin is iter facio. That's how you can say I travel somewhere, iter facere, to travel. So we are traveling all together in this uh, fusion journey. But iter isn't the only one. Iter is this huge thing. It's this amazing multi-story tall thing that they're building in France now. And I've been looking forward to this for years and years and years, waiting for the first plasma to be be made, and that's coming up in a few years. But in the meantime, a lot of other reactors have been designed for experimental purposes to actually create or to lead to creating the first nuclear fusion reactor, which will produce more power than is put into it. And if you're interested in this topic at all, let me know in the comments, because you might know about some of these and you might have heard about them. You might want to know more about one specific nuclear fusion experimental reactor or another. It's extremely exciting. And ITER is designed to be the first reactor that will actually win this race to produce more power than is put into it. But it might be one of these others. If you're interested in that at all, let me know in the comments, especially if you have one in particular that you want me to talk about next time. You may know that nuclear power, whether it's nuclear fission or nuclear fusion, is named after the nucleus of an atom. But did you know that nucleus means a little nut? In Latin, the word nux, like the nux on a tree, a nux. In Italian, it's noce. Nux, when you make it diminutive, you get nucleus or nucleus. Nucleus. And then what happens is a kind of syncopation or the dropping of the U vowel in between the C and the L. So nucleus becomes nucleus. This happens sometimes in Latin, for example, with the ulus, ula, ulum suffix, which is a diminutive suffix most of the time in Latin. Uh, but sometimes it's not like the word oculus, meaning I. That can be syncopated and you have oculus, and oculus becomes occhio in Italian, where the uh, oculus, then oculus, and then the cl, the cla, that, that, that cla, 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 is how that happens. So oculus, 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 occhio. Occhio, occhio. So that happens in Italian. And there's also a great example of it even in, in the literature of Latin. For example, Novo Sordo Cyclorum, uh, which is found, for example, in the back of the $1 bill, the United States $1 bill. Um, that Cyclorum is found in Virgil in the fourth eclogue. So it should be in like textbook Latin, Cyclorum, but obviously in normal Latin, that vowel could be syncopated away, and you can say cyclorum or cyclorum, and both were correct in classical Latin. A word on orthoepy, on correct pronunciation in English. So people say nuclear sometimes in English instead of nuclear. Probably one of the reasons they do that is the same reason that Italian says occhio, uh, ojo, for example, in Spanish, where you can see that it, transform it transformed even more. Um, occhio from oculus, actually from oculus, because that cla sound wasn't very comfortable. So that's uh, that's how it happened. We see this also, for example, in the Italian word in the Italian word vecchio, which is from um, wetus originally. Well, wetus, how does that work? Wetus means old in Latin. Wetus. And wetus, and then a little old person, for example, and little old, old man would be a wetulus. Now let's do a little syncope, a little jazz. And we get wetlus, wetlus. So wetlus, one uh, possible pronunciation it could have had at one point, instead of just wetlus, would be where uh, it becomes more lateral. The sound becomes wetlus, wetlus. The uh, tla sound, I believe that's a sound found in um, uh, some uh, Mesoamerican um, languages, right? Like uh, uh, the way to say Quetzalcoatl, which I, I won't attempt to do, or chocolate, uh, the original words for that, which are spelled this way. I'll put them on the screen. Um, but I, I won't attempt to pronounce them now because I, I haven't studied that phonology very closely. Uh, so, wet, wetulus, wetlus, 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 and the la, because it's, you know, pronounced in the palate there, um, wetlus, wetlus, uh, wetlus, wetlus, eventually the C, the T-L and C-L 
emerge in a later form of proto-romance um, or an earlier form of proto-romance and then a later form of, uh, of late Latin. So it is tla becomes the same as kla and eventually just tla for both. So vecchio from, eventually, from original wetus, wetulus. But when people say nuclear, maybe that's, that's why. Maybe, that, maybe that's why they're saying nuclear because nuclear, uh, just for whatever reason, doesn't fit their phonology. This is also why a lot of people in uh, English can be heard to say ax instead of ask because the SK sequence isn't very common in English. It does occur, obviously, in the word ask, uh, but uh, a lot of people say ax, and that happens because that k sound, that x sound, well, that's very common in English, but uh, s k isn't, and it's a metathesis. I believe this also happened with the word wasp, where it was in Old English, something like wolves, and I'll have to check that, but, but uh, I remember that metathesis, uh, something like that happening with the word wasp. So metathesis with um, uh, those kinds of things, that can, that can happen. And uh, so with nuclear, or in fact, really nuclear, that's how we normally say it, right? Nuclear, we have a metathesis of essentially the E going before and becoming nuke, so instead of li, nuclear, nuclear. And it seems to be what's happening there. Um, and uh, if one pronounces it nuclear, I would actually say etymologically in Latin, it's not that bad because nucleus, or in fact nucleus. Nucleus isn't attested to my knowledge, but that would create a root word nucul, and then we could put an ar, nucularis, nucularis, nucular. Um, now that's not how it's spelled in standard English, but people do pronounce it that way. Um, I tend to be more descriptivist than prescriptivist. Uh, I wasn't always that way. My good friend, Rafael Turigiano, he's He's uh, persuaded me with his linguistic might uh, over time. Uh, but um, I would say that the fact that people say nuclear is a very interesting kind of uh, solecism. Um, but I think we can also sort of justify it, uh, given the combination of sounds that may not be comfortable to say. Maybe not consciously uncomfortable, but you just create the desire for a more euphonic nuclear instead of nuclear. But um, there you go. Do you like these kinds of videos where I, I mix the science with the language? I do, because that's how I think and I approach everything, really, whenever I deal with whatever subject. So uh, I hope you enjoy this polymathic sort of video. <laughs> Thanks so much for watching. Walete. The goal of Iter is not to run out of breath. <laughs>